The scripture reading is Psalm 37, 12, and 13. Psalm 37, 12, and 13. The wicked part against the just. Gas him, gas at him with his teeth. The Lord laughs at him, for he sees that the day is coming. Well, last week we studied Psalm 37, 1 through 11, so let's review by reading. Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in the way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. It only causes harm. For evildoers shall be cut off. But those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. But the meek shall inherit the earth and delight themselves in the abundance of peace. This 40-verse psalm continues then with the encouragement. For those people who might be put off by the wicked who might be envious of the wicked, who might be fretting because of the wicked, and tells us how to handle that sort of thing. First of all, in verse 12, notice that in the face of evil, we don't fret. We In the face of evil, we don't fear either. The wicked plots against the just and gnashes at him with his teeth. There's a picture, isn't it? Have you ever seen the gnashing of teeth when someone is angry? Someone snarls at you. Someone is so angry. Well, that's what the wicked do against the just. The wicked plots against the just and gnashes at him with his teeth. And that comes up a few more times in the rest of this psalm. In Psalm 35, verse 16, the psalmist is praying one of those imprecatory psalms where he's saying, God, get those who, uh, who are after me, essentially. He says, with ungodly mockers at feasts, they gnashed at me with their teeth. The wicked plots against the just. One of the frustrating things that I had to face 20 or 30 years ago was getting people to believe that in this country there were actually people plotting against the just. There have always been people plotting against the just. If that sounds too conspiratorial to you, well, I'm sorry. The Bible says the wicked are plotting against the just. They did it in Jeremiah's day. They did it in Jeremiah's day when he, um, when he told the people things that they did not want to hear. They said, we can't stop the priest from speaking the law. We can't stop this wise man from speaking counsel. I'm paraphrasing Jeremiah 18 verse 18. And we can't stop the prophet from speaking the word of God. So let's cut him, let's, let's attack him with the tongue. And let us not give heed to any of his words. Let's do some character assassination on him. And back in Jeremiah 11 verse 19, they just planned, planned to cut him off from the face of the earth. So that his name may be remembered no more. They were going to kill him. The wicked plots against the just. It's happened in every age. It's happened in every society. It still happens today. Oh, I don't think I should overwhelm you with illustrations from the news. Here are just a couple. Think of what's going on with the library debates throughout the country. In the libraries, the reports are that the younger children are having perverted books thrown at them, versions books that celebrate the kinds of things that are being celebrated this month and they're being groomed and that sort of thing is what it all amounts to. And when you, some pe good people come along and try to get those books out of the library, the librarians cry, censorship, censorship. Well, if that happens anywhere, I would hope that some good Christian people would call their bluff. They're crying censorship. Okay, let's bring some Christian books in there. And let's teach about Christianity. Let's put, may I, may I donate this book to your library? Oh no, I can't? Oh, so you're a censor too. And if you say, well, that's a separation of religion from the state. We've got to keep those two separate. Well, I almost guarantee you that if you took in a book teaching Islam, took in a book teaching Hinduism, took in a book teaching Buddhism, all those would be readily accepted. These people are not for the separation of religion and state. They're for the separation of Christianity. The wicked plot against the just. 
And for another quick example, you remember Jack Phillips' case. He's been in, he's been in court for 12 years because they set him up. They called and asked him to do a cake, to decorate a cake for a wedding of a couple of men together. And he said, I'll sell you anything you want in the store and I'll be kind to you, but I can't put my artwork to that. And they took him to the Supreme Court. And while that was in the Supreme Court, a transgender lawyer called and said, I'd like a cake celebrating my transition. He said, I can't do that. And while that's in court, somebody calls and says, I'd like you to decorate a cake that shows Satan smoking marijuana. And he said, I can't do that. And he's still in court to this day. The wicked plot against the just and gnashes at him with their teeth. And it's very discouraging to us. Sometimes it's discouraging that people won't open their eyes to it. But once our eyes are open to it, it's very discouraging that it happens. But the rest of the psalm gives us some sort of hope. Verse 13, the Lord laughs at him, for he sees that his day is coming. God's not amused by this. He's not laughing in a jovial sort of way. It's a, it's a picture. It's a word picture. It's the kind of laughter like I would get if I were trying to play basketball against Shaquille O'Neal or something like that. And he'd just say, oh, come on. Something like that. Well, God says these wicked who are plotting all this, they're not going to get away with it in the long run. The Lord laughs at him for he sees that his day is coming. Verse 14, the wicked have drawn the sword and have bent their bow to cast down the poor and needy, to slay those who are of upright conduct. The sword, those are weapons of war. And the wicked stands there ready to slay these people, ready to kill people who are of upright conduct. The Bible says, Their sword shall enter their own heart, and their bows shall be broken. Remember cases in the Bible where that happened? Remember Haman that wanted to kill all the Jews? And especially Mordecai, when Mordecai wouldn't bow down to him? So at the suggestion of his wife, he had a gallows built for Haman to hang him the next morning. But the story ends up that Haman hangs on those gallows himself because of his pride, because of his arrogance, and because of his plotting against the just. You might remember a lesser known story in 2 Samuel 15, 16, and 17 where King David's son Absalom is leading a rebellion against the people. He makes all the right political promises. He stands at the gate of the city and says... Oh, you have a lawsuit to bring to somebody? Well, there's nobody to hear you, but if I were king, you'd get your way. That sounds like a good case to me. Absalom won the people over to himself that way. And then David and his men had to leave Jerusalem. Ahithophel. Ahithophel was one of David's wise counselors. His counsel was so wise that it was as if God was speaking. At least that's how the people viewed it. One verse in 2 Samuel 16 says... But Ahithophel committed treason against David and stayed with Absalom in the city. David prayed this prayer in 2 Samuel 15 verse 31. Let the counsel of Ahithophel be turned to foolishness. Don't let his counsel work, God. So what happened in short was that Ahithophel gave advice for a particular battle, how to cut off David and his men. But Absalom also asked Hushai the archite, who was kind of left there as a spy for David. Hushai gave bad advice, but the king accepted it as good. And Ahithophel went home and got his affairs in order and killed himself. He was so upset that his advice was not taken. Are there ever times that you look at the plans of people and you say, turn their counsel into foolishness? Don't let that work out. Please let them fail. I think there probably are times. That's what happens sometimes. The arms of the wicked shall be broken, it says later in the psalm. Here it says, their swords shall enter their own heart and their bows shall be broken. A little, verse 16, that a righteous man has is better than the riches of many wicked. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. Verses 18 and 19 tell us there's going to be a remnant. The Lord knows the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time, and in the days of famine they shall be satisfied. The Lord knows the days of the upright. He knows time. He knows where they're going to go with things. He knows who they are, and He knows their, their time and life frame on this earth. Their inheritance shall be forever. Remember, He's talking about the land, but we're talking about Christianity and heaven. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time, and in the days of famine shall be satisfied. There will be an evil time, but they won't be ashamed. 
There will be times of famine, figuratively speaking, but these people won't perish because the Lord will supply them. The Lord knows His people. You, you might think of that as the remnant. Throughout Israelite history, whenever there was a great judgment from God because of the sins of the people, there would always be a remnant of people that were still trying to fight against the idolatry and still trying to fight against all of the wickedness. The remnant of people. It's pictured well in Ezekiel chapter 9 where God's glory is departing from the temple. The first ten chapters of Ezekiel are about God's glory. It's pictured with those four living creatures and the great tall wheels with eyes all around them and the sea of glass over them and the throne of God over them, the cherubim. It's pictured like that. And in Ezekiel 1 through 10, the glory of God is departing from the temple in all these apocalyptic pictures. In chapter 8, there are all kinds of evil things that are written on the walls of the temple, idolatry going on in the temple. In chapter 9, God says to bring these particular men forth and six stout men, angelic beings with battle axes in their hand, stand at the gates of the city. And God wants them to start slaying, start killing. But he says, stop until we mark those who sigh and cry over the abominations in Jerusalem. There were still people who hated sin. There were still people who didn't want sin to be. And so one of those men with a battle axe also appears with a writer's inkhorn at his side. He goes around, starts at the house of God and starts marking people. These are the ones you should let live. Now that's an apocalyptic picture. It didn't literally happen. But what it tells us is that God knows who his people are, knows there is a remnant, and he will protect those people somehow, some way. It may not be from death, but it will protect them in the afterlife. He'll protect their souls. That kind of picture is carried over, you remember, to the book of Revelation. Where there are those people who are worshiping the beast or the, the representation of the Roman government and the representation of the emperor worship that fed the Roman government. But there are also those people who were marked with the seal of God on their foreheads. And those were the people that belonged to God. He knew those who were his. The Lord knows the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time, and in the days of famine they shall be satisfied. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 19 puts it like this. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands. The Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of Christ, depart from iniquity. The Lord knows those who are His. And then as those people thrive, as the remnant thrives in the midst of all this evil, and as there is recompense for those people who plot against the just, there is also a retreat of the wickedness. Verse 20, But the wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord, like the splendor of the meadow, they shall vanish, like smoke they shall vanish away. There are different possibilities of that translation. The New King James has like the splendor of the meadow. I haven't gone and checked the translations like I should have, but I read in the commentaries that some of the translations might lean towards something like the fat of the lamb. Like the fat of the lamb shall vanish. Well, both of these things are things that vanish pretty quickly. If you burn fat on a grill, it burns up pretty quickly. And the splendor of the meadow, oh, it's just beautiful. But it doesn't last for long. Winter comes. These people, these evil people, like the splendor of the meadows, shall vanish. And into smoke they shall vanish away. Don't fear these wicked people. There will be a recompense for them. There will be a remnant that fights against them. And there will be a retreat of these wicked people eventually. Then he says in verses 21 through 29, Do not forget some things. Verse 21 and 22, The wicked borrows and does not repay, but the righteous shows mercy and gives. For those blessed by him shall inherit the earth, but those cursed by him shall be cut off. There is a contrast. There are people who get their money the right way. There are people who work hard, labor, as Paul says, so that they have something to give. There are people who don't take a hand out for granted. There are people who mind their own business and aspire to lead a quiet life, the way Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 4, to work with their own hands that they may lack nothing. Those are the kind of people that God blesses. Those are the kind of people whose descendants are blessed. These people are blessed by God to inherit the earth. But there are also people who cheat. And those cheaters never have any kind of blessing from God. And though they may seem to thrive for a little while, they will always be cut off. Those cursed by him shall be cut off. The wicked borrows and does not repay. 
Jeremiah chapter 21 verse 17 says, As a partridge broods but does not hatch. Picture a bird sitting on the eggs but there's no fruit coming from it, no eggs coming from it, no chickens coming from it. As a partridge that broods but does not hatch, so is he who gets his riches but not by right. It shall leave him in the midst of his days, and at his end he shall be made a fool. And speaking of one of the last kings of Judah, Jeremiah 22 verse 13 says, Woe to him who builds his house by unrighteousness and his chambers by injustice, who uses his neighbor's service without wages and gives him nothing for his work. These people are cheaters. In Ezekiel chapter 22 verse 13, God says, I beat my fist at the dishonest prophet that you have made. And then in James chapter 5, there's a more extended passage. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corroded, your garments are moth-eaten, your gold and silver are corroded, and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You've heaped up treasure in the last days, and that's not a good treasure. The wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, have cried out, and their cries have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts. You have condemned the just. You've murdered. You've slaughtered. He does not resist you. God lets them get away with it for a little bit, but their corrosion will be a witness against them. The corrosion of that gold and silver and their riches will be corrupted. These people cheat to get ahead, but they will be brought low. The wicked borrows and does not repay, but the righteous shows mercy and gives. Those blessed by him shall inherit the earth, and those cursed by him shall be cut off. There's a contrast. Don't forget the contrast. God knows the contrast. And don't forget that the righteous are conquerors. Verse 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. I have been young, and now am old, yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging bread. He is ever merciful and lends, and his descendants are blessed. The righteous conquered. The righteous may fall seven times, but he'll get up again. Proverbs 24 verse 16 says, Here God upholds the righteous. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. These other people have riches. These other people have earthly power. Those things are going to fade away fast. But the righteous man, though he live a humble life, has the Lord upholding him. And he may not have a lot of riches, but the psalmist tells us, hey, I used to be young, now I'm old, and this thing I've never seen. I've never seen a righteous person begging for bread. I've never seen a righteous person without. Now I suppose there's a possibility that that could come about. In Luke chapter 16, you read about Lazarus, the beggar who dies and goes to be in Abraham's bosom. But generally speaking, God provides. And didn't he promise that in New Testament times? Why do you worry about clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory is not arrayed like one of these. That was the flowers of the field. And the birds of the air, they, they don't sow or they don't reap and they get what they need. And so Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things, these physical things, will be added to you. We're conquerors. Don't forget that. And then don't forget that there are consequences for the evil man. Consequences, on the other hand, for the good man. Verse 27, depart from evil and do good and dwell forevermore. For the Lord loves justice and does not forsake his saints. They are preserved forever, but the descendants of the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell in it forever. Well, depart from evil and do good. That's what God wants. Dwell forevermore that way. The descendants of the wicked will be cut off, but the righteous, the meek, inherit the land. Do not forget those things. And then, lastly in the chapter, in the psalm rather, do not falter. There are real fruits of righteousness that can be seen in people who heed God's commands. Verse 30, the mouth of the righteous speaks wisdom, and his tongue talks of justice. The law of God is in his heart, and none of his steps shall slide. Remember Romans 6 where you're supposed to use your members as instruments of righteousness to God? Well, here's how the righteous uses his mouth. He speaks wisdom. How does he know wisdom? The law of God is in his heart. What does he do with his tongue? He speaks justice. 
He's going to speak these things that God wants. Not the injustice, not the fraud, not the cheating, not the power mongering. God wants the justice and the righteousness and there will be fruits for those people who seek those exact things. And then verse 32 and 33 reminds us again, the wicked watches the righteous and seeks to slay him. The Lord will not leave him in his hand nor condemn him when he is judged. The wicked are on the prowl again, but God's not going to leave him in the hand of the wicked. But God will not condemn that righteous man in the hand of the wicked. No, God is on our side. And then there is a finality in judgment for those people. Wait on the Lord, verse 34, and keep his way. He shall exalt you to inherit the land. I like this part a lot. I don't understand it all. I don't understand where it will take place. When the wicked are cut off, you shall see it. Wait on the Lord and keep his way. You shall be exalted. To, he shall exalt you to inherit the land. And when the wicked are cut off, you shall see it. I've seen the wicked, he says, in great power and spreading himself like a native green tree. You know how trees grow so fast. And if they're on the ground and they spread, that kind of tree that spread, the vines that spread out, that you keep fighting and you can't hold back. I've seen the wicked in great power and spreading himself like a native green tree. Yet, he passed away. Behold, he was no more. Indeed, I sought him, but he could not be found. There is finality in judgment. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Isaiah 40 verses 30 and 31 say, wait on the Lord. We don't go out as people looking for vengeance. That belongs to God. We don't go out as people fretting with anger. The first part of the psalm told us not to do that. We have to be people who sit back, smile when people falsely accuse, and wait for the salvation of the Lord. There are futures conflicting for these two types of people. Verse 37 through 39. Mark the blameless man and observe the upright. For the future of that man is peace. But transgressors shall be destroyed together. The future of the wicked shall be cut off. Did you see the contrast? Did you see the futures that conflict? Mark the blameless man. Observe the upright. The future of that man is peace. The transgressors are going down. They're going down together. And the future of the wicked shall be cut off. But, another contrast, the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their strength in time of trouble. People will Remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. I tell you, that's not easy to take when people say false things about you. But our Lord had to do it. He went through it first. Paul went through it and defended himself. Jesus, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. You wait on the Lord and keep his way. And he shall exalt you to inherit the land. And then the psalm closes. And the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them because they trust in him. We live, as everybody mentions in their prayers, in perilous times. I suppose we notice the peril a lot more now than we used to. It is, I think, objectively more perilous than it was 20 or 30 or 40 years ago, at least in this area of the world, but it's always been perilous somewhere. The wicked always plot against the just somewhere. And the just survive. Now, I know there might be some splitting of hairs to go on, when you ask, who are these wicked people? And who are these just people? Nobody is just in the sight of God. All have sinned and fall short of His glory. I realize that. But if we can get past the hair splitting, we can see that there are people who are trying to do good. And there are people who are trying to do evil. And the main message you get from this psalm is God knows the difference. And He and His justice somehow will work things out on behalf of those who are striving for good. Now this psalm was written a thousand years before Christ. Updated, it applies specifically to individuals as to whether or not they're going to be faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus had not come yet. David wrote this psalm. He was a forerunner of Christ. Christ came a thousand years later in the lineage of David. He was called the son of David. And when Christ came, he demanded that people believe in him because he came to save us from our sins. He came to reach out to these wicked people and try not just to punish them, but to change them. 
A woman who's been with five husbands and one living with now she's not married to. He wants to change her life and he did. A man who's killing Christians. He wants to change his life and he did. Jesus has a power, shows a power. And there's been a power in this universe since he came that was foreign to the people of the time of this psalm. Even then, they knew that God would uphold the righteous. But now, there's Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Believe in him, repent of sins, confess him, be baptized for the remission of sins. That's how you get started in the life of being a good person to him. And then, depart from evil and do good and dwell forevermore. See how many of these statements apply even in the New Testament age. And then the land won't be yours, but heaven will be yours. And if you've been unfaithful, come back to him. If we could help you, would you please come as we stand and sing?